I'm so happy to be here. And my talk is entitled, Emotional Labor, Ritual Grief in a Medieval Jewish Thought and Practice. Sometime, probably in the 11th century and probably in Alexandria, a woman wrote, or more likely dictated, this letter that you're looking at on the screen to send to her uncle, telling him that she and her mother had been suffering terribly since both her father and grandfather had died a short time apart from each other. I write this letter healthy in my soul, but distracted in my heart. Um, and then there's some words missing, um, but she references her grandfather's death, may God have mercy on him, says to her uncle, what helped him the most in his illness was hearing from my father, may God have mercy on him. But then there's a kind of uh, lacuna in the text, and we can infer that the father died as well, because she then says, may God have mercy on them both. And so we've been cut off. No one enters or leaves us. And this is a common formula in letters from this period for women who are socially isolated, often because they have no male relatives who are socially supporting them. She then goes on to say, as for my mother, she hasn't something from grief and weeping night and day. She has no eye or body left. We're afraid that something may happen to her. Anywhere there's weeping, baka, she goes there and won't return until she's fainted. We worry about her constantly. This letter survived in the Cairo Geniza, which, as I'm sure many of you know, um, is a massive collection of medieval manuscript fragments and pieces of everyday writing that endured by chance inside a synagogue in Fustat, is, uh, Egypt's first Islamic capital, nowadays part of Cairo, um, where the little star is on the map. Um, the synagogue that this material um, survived in um, looked like this in the early 20th century. Um, it has since been restored. Um, to sort of Ottoman era splendor. Um, and the picture on the right, or at least it's on the right of my screen, is a kind of um, reconstruction of what the entry to the Geniza chamber looked like in the late 19th century, which actually is probably not what it looked like at all prior to the late 19th century. So we actually have no idea what it looked like, um, but it's a nice picture. The documentary part of the Geniza corpus comprises around 40,000 individual pieces of everyday writing, including letters, petitions, legal documents, accounts, lists, and many other subgenres. Um, most of the material is in Arabic, mainly Judeo-Arabic, Arabic in Hebrew script, which is what the letter that we just looked at is written in. Um, but there's also fragments of um, Arabic script Arabic and texts in Hebrew, Aramaic, and actually a vast array of other languages, but mostly only very small amounts of those other languages. The corpus comes mainly from Egypt and Syria during the 11th to early 13th centuries. And overall, this cache of material gives us what's probably the richest and most intimate look at everyday life among ordinary people that we have from anywhere in the world during the Middle Ages. The people that it shows us were mainly urban Jews, who at least in Fustat itself, lived in a densely populated mixed religious neighborhood. So Fustat was Egypt's first Islamic capital um, and it was built around a pre-Islamic Roman fortress, which you can see here, it's the kind of round structure. Again, this is from an early 20th century photograph. The neighborhood that the Geniza Synagogue was in um, was actually right around this old fortress. So on this map, it's the little kind of black circle. Um, and this is a map showing the mosques, churches, and synagogues that we know existed in the neighborhood during the Middle Ages. So the blue one is the Geniza Synagogue. I don't know why this image didn't also show the Karaite synagogue, which was also there. But anyway, you can see there's a lot of churches and at least one mosque. Um, the medieval Jews who we glimpsed through this material um, identified either as rabbinites, um, meaning that they adhered, at least in theory, to rabbinic tradition as it had coalesced by the early Middle Ages, or as Karaites. Charism was a medieval movement that rejected rabbinic tradition. Um, in favor of close interaction with the biblical text informed by contemporary Islamic literary and exegetical models, um, and that itself sort of developed in the wake of the rabbinization of Judaism um, transregionally in the early Middle Ages. Um, but beyond that formal identification, these people seem to have been relatively religiously boring, by which I mean um, this is not a period of high religious fervor or schism. We don't have any messianic pretenders or anything like that. Um, on the other hand, these people's status as Jews um, and certain Jewish practices did order many aspects of their lives in tangible ways. For example, Jews ran many of their domestic transactions through a Jewish court system that operated pretty much in line with prescriptive rabbinic law, um, at least at a technical level, although at the same time they also used Islamic courts. The literate Jews, whose letters we have from the Geniza, spoke in a comfortably and ubiquitously religious idiom, 
that drew equally from the Bible and rabbinic literature on the one hand, and from the Islamically inflected Arabic culture of their day on the other. Um, the best introduction to this incredibly fascinating world remains a five-volume work written by S.D. Goytime, the founding father of Geniza Studies. Um, a lot of work has been done since Goytime, but this is still, I think, the gateway drug to the Geniza. However, if you're inclined to be online rather than reading a book, I want to put in a plug for the Princeton Geniza Lab um, under my colleague, Professor Marina Rusto, um, which in the last couple of years has like radically expanded its footprint of metadata to include descriptions of all kinds of documents that are not in Goytime that we didn't even know about until recently. Um, and it's very fun to just play around with, even if you don't know the languages. It's just little English descriptions of them. OK, so now I'll go back to uh, morning. I am in the very early stages of gathering Geniza and other material that illuminates the social history of death in medieval Egypt. This is a subject that's barely been written about so far, not among Jews, not among anyone else, um, and for which the Geniza documents offer an incredible wealth of evidence. And so when Jenny, Professor Grayson, um, invited me to come speak, I was really excited to, because I'm participating in this wonderful initiative we're having here, to take seriously the history of female labor among pre-modern Jews. Um, I am not right now working on female labor, labor, but it was a perfect opportunity for me to start thinking about um, one aspect of this death project, namely a type of women's work um, that I think is lurking behind this letter that we just looked at, um, and that is a, an important his part of the history of death in this time and place and many other, namely women's mourning. So um, I just want to say the research I'm about to present is really preliminary. Um, it's a fun topic, so I think it'll be interesting anyway, but it's definitely not exhaustive. If any of you know of sources I didn't mention or have ideas, I would be delighted to hear them. Okay, so when this woman states that her mother goes and seeks out places where there's weeping, um, and then weeps herself and won't return until she's fainted, um, what she is probably talking about is gatherings of mourners, either at the synagogue or in private households, who are weeping in a particular, possibly semi-ritualized and certainly public manner that is meant to invoke participant grief, which is exactly what it's doing for her. Another Geniza letter sent from Sicily to Fustat, also in the 11th century, uses the same term for weeping, baka, um, to describe this is really bizarre. It's the only example of this that I know, but it's a mother writing to her son that she thought he had died. And so she says, um, three years ago, news reached us that you'd perish. We made a great funeral for you and wept for you the weeping that one weeps for someone who dies in a foreign land without dear ones and without anyone who knows him. So this was a funeral in no sense, except that they were engaging in this kind of ritual weeping and presumably um, dirges and elegies and other kinds of liturgical um, activities. It is not a coincidence that both of these letters are about women. Group lament in Geniza documents is mainly associated with women. And while we don't know if the female weepers in either of these letters were being paid for their weeping, weeping um, it is possible that some of them were, because other Geniza documents do mention paid mourners. Um, this is a legal document in which a woman being sued by her son-in-law for her daughter's estate, so his late wife's estate, says that there is nothing left of the estate um, as for what the dead girl left, I didn't spend something, something on her. Um, I don't have anything left. And in the middle, you can see that she says the burial and the wailing or screaming, siyah. So she spent the money to, for the funeral expenses, for the shrouds, for the burial, and for the screaming, and so nothing is left. Um, this letter uses this term siyah, but the more common term in this period is niyaha. Um, this is a term that still exists today in modern standard Arabic. Um, and it denotes specifically a kind of mourning cry and its other meanings, which might allow us to imagine, at least in theory, what this cry at some point in the history of this term was like, um, are it's sort of the howling of the wind or the cooing of a pigeon. A handful of Geniza documents use the term na'eha, so the feminine active participle um, of this verb, uh, weeping woman, as a professional name for certain women. So for example, this is a death list from the Geniza, and among the many names that it lists are the son of the Na'eha, the whaler's son. Um, references of this kind embedded in names, and actually often in the names of sons of women, um, are one of the main ways that we hear about women's professions in the Geniza. And by profession in this context, I mean a form of labor that was specialized enough that a woman who performed it was known by the specific terms. So this is not the full range of women's labor at all. So many, many women engage in textile labor, sometimes live off of their textile labor, um, but they don't go by the name of like, 
a textile worker. So we only get this for certain kinds of specialized professions. Um, and whaler is one of a whole suite of professions like this that are distinctively female and that mostly involve the care of other women's bodies. So for example, this is a tax list um, which has both the children of the doctor's son, and that's a female doctor. Um, and uh, this is, I don't know what this actually means, it's interesting, but the craftsman for the female comber. So somehow he was her helper or her sort of producer of whatever she used to comb. Goitain thought this had to do with bridal combing, I'm not sure. Um, here we have um, the son of Abu Sa'd, the midwife's son, and the term for midwife is literally the catcher. <laughs> um, uh, Abu Khair, the hair remover's son, again feminine. Um, and then very interestingly, this is an alms list that has both the female washer for the room, meaning the Byzantine or European Jews who lived in Fustat, and what this means is corpse washer. So she, is, she washes the dead. And then on the same list, on a different page, from a different date, but like the same register, um, another female washer from Fustat. Okay, so these washers um, are both in an alms list, which probably indicates that that was a low status, low paid profession. Um, although it may also be because they were communal employees, but certainly some kinds of communal employees do not show up on these lists, and others do. Um, and it's also possible that whaler was a low status profession. Um, for example, here we have um, Ibrahim the whaler's son on an alms list. Um, but it is not clear to me that that is always the case. Um, another reference to a whaler appears in this court record. Um, and in this case, it's a, actually a draft of a court record. Um, the witness says, I, Abu Surur, bin Asabar, or witness for Sitriad the whaler, and then it, what he's bearing witness about is a very generous charity gift that she's giving. Um, half of a building that she owns, well, half of the portion of a building that she owns to the Karaites, and a little bit more than half to the Rabbinites, which, by the way, is not at all unusual for people to support both of them. Um, so this woman is w very um, wealthy. We also have women who, at least their sons, end up poor. Um, so it's actually not clear. Um, and part of the reason for this is that whaling may not have been a single thing. So it may have been kind of a variety of forms of practice. Um, this is a little note in a court record as well, um, recording the sale of a female slave, an enslaved woman, who is both called the singing woman and the whaler. So first of all, this tells us that this was a profession sometimes held by specialized, trained domestic slaves, um, but also that it had some connection with singing, at least in this case. Um, this is a slide where, uh, sorry, this is a document um, uh, noting all the money that was spent out of this man's estate, um, and in addition to paying the poll tax and paying for the grave digging and the grave building and the washing of the body um, and the canters, uh, there's no whaling here, but there are dancers. So that's some other kind of uh, ritual performance at this guy's funeral. Um, and finally, we have quite a lot of evidence for male cantors, um, chazanim, officiating at funerals as well. Um, the evidence about them is actually more voluminous and more specific, big surprise, than for um, female whalers. Um, this is an invitation to a cantor, inviting him to come early tomorrow and pray during these days for the deceased honors, and he'll receive payment. Um, but those aren't mutually exclusive, meaning it isn't that you would either have female whalers or a cantor. Um, they're both forms of practice that existed in some combination that we don't really know um, around funerals. Um, this is a letter from 12th century Alexandria sent to Fustat talking about what's been going on in a house of mourning. Um, again, there's, you can see half the document is missing, so words are missing, but we can reconstruct enough to see that there is weeping and slapping going on throughout the seven days of mourning in the house. But there is also a cantor who comes to the house and sings piyutim, liturgical poetry, and sluchot. So there's the kind of male um, liturgical mourning alongside the weeping and slapping, which he doesn't say is female, but it may have been. There is some evidence that professional female mourners, in fact, offered a luxury service. This is an absolutely fascinating woman's will from the Geniza. And to, in which I'm just giving you a little part of it. It's a very, very long document. But the witnesses enter the dar, the building, um, of this man, the pharmacist, and they find his daughter sick and confined to her bed, which is a standard rabbinic opening um, that allows her to give away her property. She said to us, when the end overtakes me, I should be buried in this building that I'm in now. I won't leave it until someone from my family dies, whether my father or mother or brother, 
then they may take me out with the one who has died. Um, this is very interesting. Elsewhere in the will, you could see that she does not like her husband at all. <laughs> She's very close to her family. Um, then she gives these very long instructions for the shrouds that she's going to be buried in. Um, all these different kinds of textiles, a debiki wrap, a head wrap, a cloak, an outer wrap, a half wrap, silk. It should come to 25 dinars and the coffin 9 to 10 dinars. Okay, that is like a huge, huge amount of money. Um, our standard reference point in our field, which may or may not be accurate, is Goitain's calculation that a middle class family in Fustat could live on two dinars a month. Um, so this is a lot of money. Um, and then she ends with, they should wail for me with Muslims. So this is interesting on a lot of levels. First of all, she wants luxury whaling, which apparently involves Muslims. <laughs> this is the only such reference we have. But second of all, you can see that this is a part of the kind of um, burial with a lot of pomp and honor that she wants. On the other end of the spectrum, not having whalers was a sign of austerity. So this is a little bit of a legal document in which probably a will there's not enough left to tell, in which a man is giving instructions. Um, it's strange, because he's saying he doesn't want a whole lot, but then he actually says quite a lot of things that he wants. But anyway, he's giving a message of austerity that begins, no whalers. No whalers, and I only want two cloaks, three robes, a turban, <laughs> underpants, and a belt. Um, and he also wants to be buried um, near his uncle or his wife, so he has a better marital relationship than our first woman. OK, sorry, before I get to that, I have to transition. OK, so it's clear from these sources that hiring professional female mourners engaged in various forms of weeping, clapping, perhaps dancing, perhaps singing, were a standard feature of Jewish responses to death in medieval Egypt and Syria, and likely elsewhere around the Islamic Mediterranean. So just in the slides I showed you, we had an example from Fatima in Sicily. Um, beyond that, so far, I haven't found any way to know what these performances actually looked or sounded like. Um, but we can imagine them, at least sort of vaguely, um, because performative mourning that includes variations on these features is widespread in many, many human cultures. And it's very often feminized, although not exclusively. So men engage in these behaviors as well, but very often it's kind of specially associated with women. You can go on YouTube and look up professional mourners. You'll find examples from Sardinia, from Ghana, from China. Um, this is not an isolated cultural phenomenon. And it's also a very, very old phenomenon. Um, in the Near East, we have examples from ancient Egypt. So this is a relief from the 14th to 13th century BC, um, depicting women, uh, women whalers kind of with this gesture. Um, these are some other very nice examples also from ancient Egypt. Um, and I'm showing them in part because the image here on the right um, has a very interesting detail that um, a whole article was written about that I want to just briefly read from, because I think it's a very nice expression of this practice. So if you notice, the, the robe of the kneeling woman is kind of flowing under the line. Um, and I don't know anything about ancient Egyptian art, but the author of this article, Christina Riggs, says that this is a unique example in Egyptian art of an object crossing the line between panels. Um, that's a totally unique thing. And what she says about it is um, sort of in reference to this picture, but also in reference to ritual mourning in general, um, is that mourning practices do not embody mythic timelessness. Rather, they must be inherently flexible and responsive to the needs of the society. Um, mourning occupied the liminal space between life and death and required upheaval and reversal in its performance. It was neither a spontaneous hysterical outburst nor an abstruse theological statement but it did entail physical disruption. Okay, moving on from ancient Egypt, um, we have women performing a similar gesture from um, Mesopotamian reliefs. Um, these are women from Ninve in Assyria. Um, and I'm going to the ancient Near East for a reason, which is that for the rest of the talk, I want to try to understand how Geniza mourners functioned within the broader culture of grief and mourning that existed in the time and the place they live in in part by considering some of the ways um, that grief and mourning were perceived within the two high register cultural religious traditions that left the greatest imprint on these people, namely medieval Judaism, and just as importantly in many ways, medieval Islam. So I'm going to start with Judaism, um, and I'm actually going to start in the ancient Near East, um, not with the Hebrew Bible itself, but outside the Bible, um, by just pointing out that ritual lament is perceived very positively in Mesopotamian ancient Near Eastern religion. 
Um, this is just an example from an old Babylonian prayer. May my hand raising be my offering. May my tears be my gift during the daily ritual lament. By day may it be an offering. By night may it be a supplication. So um, in this text, lament, and it doesn't say for what, is read as an act of worship. Um, this is at least partial context for the representations of lament and weeping um, that we find in the Hebrew Bible, which contains many, many evocative and detailed descriptions of weeping and lament um, that mainly have the same overall positive vibe as this Babylonian text. Um, the most famous among them for our purposes is Jeremiah 9, 16 to 19. Thus said the Lord of hosts, consider and call for the female lamenters, the Makona note that they may come, Send for the wise women that they may hurry. Take up for us a wailing, and our eyes will run down with tears. Hear, O woman, the word of the Lord. Teach your daughters wailing, and each woman to her friend lament. So in Jeremiah, wailing in the face of loss and tragedy um, is a divinely sanctioned, appropriate activity. Um, it's not presented as a form of worship exactly, but it is certainly divinely approved. Okay, now we are going to jump forward in time because we have to get to the Middle Ages to late antiquity. Um, women's performative mourning, including professional mourning, was a common feature of Roman funerals. Um, oops, what did I do with myself? The most famous um, image of a Roman funeral, as far as I can tell, is this relief from first century BC Italy. Um, and you can see the, the body on the bier and just to the right what appear to be two female mourners, one of them doing this same gesture to the head. Um, it's worth noting that there is a huge complex body of evidence for and scholarship about these practices in the Roman context, which I am mostly not going to discuss. Um, but I want to flag one that will be important for our story, which is aristocratic distaste of this kind of mourning, not just paid mourning, but performative mourning in general, and approval of restraint. So this is Plutarch in a lovely letter he sent his wife after their young daughter died. Only my dear wife, in your emotion, keep me as well as yourself within bounds. For I know and can set a measure to the magnitude of our loss. But if I find any extravagance of distress in you, this will be more grievous to me than what has happened, the never, namely the death of their daughter. The never sated passion for lamentation, a passion which incites us to transports of wailing and of beating the breast, is no less shameful than incontinence in pleasure. So here we get both a description of public performative wailing, or mourning anyhow, um, wailing and beating the breast, um, but also a condemnation of it. This distaste makes its way into early Christian sources um, and gets cast in a religious register. So this is Severus of Antioch, and I'm taking the quote from this very nice book, Death in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, speaking very contemptuously about some of these same practices. They tear their hair, furrow their cheeks, rent their tunics, sit on sackcloths and inside ashes, and so on. And they also summon those women who compose lamentations and become drunken with grief. Um, and uh, the author of this book points out that what you see here is the rules of pro propriety, which had predated Christianity, that ideally re regulated the behavior of the noble, became the form for all the faithful. However, Jewish sources from the Roman period do not express this perspective. Um, we have lots of small bits of evidence that Jews in Roman Palestine and in, I should say, uh, to the east of, Rome, of the Roman Empire in Sasanian Mesopotamia, engaged in and commissioned forms of ritual and professional mourning without any negative associations. Um, this is a tombstone from Egypt, from roughly the same broad period as the Roman sources we just looked at. Um, Look on my gravestone passerby, and having considered it, weep, beat with your hands five times for the five-year-old. Rabbinic sources from Palestine um, describe professional mourners as a core component of a respectable funeral. Um, a husband is obligated to give his wife food to redeem her, meaning if she's captured, um, and to bury her. And then there's an opinion, oops, that should say rabbi, not rabu. <laughs> Yehuda says, even the poorest Jew must not provide less than two flutes and a wailing woman, mekonenet. This is the same term that we have in Jeremiah. I found these mosaics. They are from Palestine. They're not a funeral, but they have flutes, so I put them on for color. Um, here, the uh, sort of hiring wailing women is tied to the wife's status. Um, but elsewhere, the Mishnah describes specific public mourning practices not necessarily being performed by professional women. 
Um, the context is certain sort of intermediate holidays where you're supposed to have a certain amount of joy, but they're not full holidays. So Rosh Chodesh, the first of the month, Hanukkah, Purim. Women may wail and clap, but they may not lament. Mekona note. Um, and then once the dead is buried, they can't do those things either. This is specifically on these days. Um, the Mishnah then asks, what is wailing? This is when they all wail together. So all the women, we don't know if they're wailing words or just wailing sounds, but they're wailing in unison. That's OK. Um, but what is not OK is lament. One speaks, and they all answer after her. So, And they're getting that from the Jeremiah verse that we just looked at, teach your daughters wailing, and each woman to her friend. They're reading that as a kind of call and response. That's not allowed on these dates. Um, the Babylonian Talmud on this passage lists a long series of specific chants or eulogies supposedly recited by women in this town in Mesopotamia, Shechan Siv. Um, they're really lovely. I'm just going to read a few. Woe to him who goes, woe to the pledge, meaning all well, humans are a pledge given by God that he then takes back. I don't understand this one, but it's colorful. The bone has been removed from the jaw and the water returns to the kettle. And um, death is death. The interest is suffering. OK, so those are women um, in the Babylonian Talmud. But the Talmud also describes male lamenters. Um, and it's speaking both of a Roman-Palestinian context and of its own context in Babylonia. Um, it uses the term saftan or saftana. Um, and in these rabbinic passages, one major theme surrounding lament is the same one that I opened with in the Geniza letter. It's the power of these kind of performative um, uh, whales to evoke grief in others, not just the immediate mourners, um, but people around them. And this is understood positively. Um, actually, this is not a, <laughs> this is also talking about um, the intermediate days. But it says, he may not agitate over his dead on these days. Um, what does that mean? And then somebody says, um, when a saftana would circulate in the West, meaning in Palestine, they would say, all who are bitter of heart weep with him. Um, even more evocatively, um, the Midrash Echaraba on Lamentations, a book that itself is a poetic lament, um, says on the verse, she weeps bitterly in the night, her tears are on her cheek, this very, very lovely series of things about the sort of evocative power of um, the, the performative mourner to get others to weep. Um, here again, it's feminized, but the beings that are being gotten to weep are not other people. Um, rather, she weeps and others weep with her. She weeps and the Holy One, blessed be he, weeps with her. She weeps and the attending angels weep with her. She weeps and heaven and earth weep with her. She weeps and the hills and valleys weep with her. So that's very powerful. But I also should note there's a slightly different tenor in a later passage in the same text, um, in the night. Why at night? Because voices carry at night. OK, so things are quiet. You can hear somebody weeping. Rabbi Aivu said, night draws lament to itself, a story, Mazeh. There was a woman in Rabban Gamliel's neighborhood whose son died young. She would weep over him in the night. Rabban Gamliel would hear her voice and remember the destruction of the temple and weep with her until his eyelashes fell out. So his students evicted her from the neighborhood. <laughs> OK. Um, now I'm going to jump to the Middle Ages. In his monumental legal code, the Mishnah Torah, Maimonides establishes the discussion in the Mishnah that I just showed you as normative. So this is about the special days, Rosh Chodesh, Hanukkah, and Purim, etc. What can you do? So he pretty much repeats the Mishnah and synthesizes it. Um, and he presents this as a form of respect for the dead. So lamenting is a form of respect for the dead. So the heirs have to hire mourners in order to show respect unless the dead person has ordered them not to, which we did see an example of before. Um, so that's the Mishnah Torah, which is a systematized legal code. However, rabbinic responses sometimes give us a more granular, complex picture of local mourning practices among medieval Jews. And unfortunately, we don't have any from Egypt or Syria, so none from the Geniza context. But we have some from other places that I think are worth briefly looking at. Um, for example, this is a uh, question sent to an early Gaon, head of the Babylonian Yeshivot in Baghdad in ninth, the 9th century. Um, that reported a practice called Sidu Kadin, um, resignation to judgment. Um, and so the response says, you asked, since we don't lament on the first of the month, remember that comes from our Mishnah, what about when they say the resignation to judgment? And this is clearly some kind of uh, sort of ritual. And the answer is that if they all chant together, it's permitted. But if one speaks and everyone answers after him, it's forbidden. And you understand why that is. It goes right back to the Mishnah that we already looked at. Um, so that's one form of local practice. Very interestingly, by the 11th century, um, somebody had this text and wrote into the Gaon in this period to ask about it. 
And he says, well, I know we have this old text from the ninth century that says this, but I don't know what you're talking about. The resignation to judgment, we don't know what this is. But then he gives a description of what he's guessing maybe it is, which I think maybe gives us a sense of what ritual mourning maybe looked like in his time and place. If you have a kind of lament such as hoy or avoy or weeping or saying how hard or something like this, then, and then he goes on to give his opinion. Um, the most elaborate description of a professional mourning, public mourning ritual um, of this kind that I have found um, appears in this responsum of um, Yitzhak ben Sheshet from 14th century Spain. Um, and he says, in Saragossa, the custom is for mourners to attend synagogue throughout the shiva. That's actually the point of the responsum because um, the questioner is assuming that mourners should stay home. Um, but for our purposes, what's interesting is what he says after that. After the prayer, they return home with most of the community um, who come with them into the courtyard. And then the lamenter, the mekonenet, agitates, and that's the same word that we saw before in one of the rabbinic passages, um, over her coming in with him. And she bangs on a drum with her hand, and the women lament and beat their palms together. Um, and since they do this for the dead's honor, you should let them do it. The illustration is from Catalonia, but also 14th century. And it's got a drum, so maybe it works. OK, so that's some of the Jewish sources. Medieval Islamic discourse about women's mourning is very different. Whereas rabbinic references to lament and wailing are either neutral or positive and appear embedded within a very detailed system that I haven't really talked about, but I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with, of other mourning practices, overturning the bed, receiving condolences, um, refraining from washing the body, refraining from sexual intercourse, and so on. In contrast, Lior Halevi, in this absolutely wonderful study of early Islamic practices surrounding death, notes that for early Islamic ju jurists, repression of violent emotion actually takes the place of any kind of more elaborate mourning system of this kind. He says, early Muslim laws on mourning concentrate on the repression of violent emotions of bereavement. Jurists and traditionalists had surprisingly little to relate by way of positive injunctions on mourning. So the discourse is all about not wailing rather than anything else. Um, both Halevi and also Peter Webb, who recently wrote a really nice article on this, cite numerous early Islamic traditions, hadith, associating performing, per performative mourning with the Jahiliya, which is the supposed pre-Islamic age of ignorance in Arabia. Whoever scratches their cheeks, tears their clothes, and mourns with cries of a Jahiliya is not one of us. Um, Hadith also condemn it in other ways. The dead is tortured in his grave by the wailing on his behalf. The wailing woman will be resurrected on the last day wearing a cloak of tar and a sheath of scabies. Or scabies, I don't know how to pronounce that. This Islamic stance very much echoes upper class Roman as well as Christian distaste for women's extreme mourning that we've already seen. However, in the Islamic context, um, these kinds of traditions are associated most closely with emphasis on submission to God resignation and submission to God's will, forbearance, um, a kind of complex of ideas that are usually expressed by the Arabic term sabr. Um, the, the Israeli scholar Avner Giladi um, has written more on this than anyone else in a series of really beautiful articles. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples of texts that he brings so you can get some of the texture of this discourse. This is also a hadith. Abu Talha's son was ill and father was out of the house and the son died. When he came home, he asked, how is my son? His wife replied, he's quieter than he has ever been. He ate supper, had enjoyment from his wife, meaning they slept together, and then she told him, bury the boy. Later, she gave birth to a boy from that night. Okay, so this is an early tradition. Um, this is a story that percolates in many different versions throughout Islamic texts, and I should note makes its way into medieval Jewish texts as well. Um, in the 14th century, Giladi cites a text that kind of just didactically spells out the point. This woman showed sabr, forbearance, steadfastness. She accepted. She acted deliberately. She prepared for herself a reward for her patience. Therefore, God replaced her lost child with a better one, although that is not what the version of the tradition that we just looked at says. OK, so in theory, if we're just focusing on this kind of literature, Jews are great, wailing, fine, Muslims, no. Um, in practice, people are much more complicated than that. Um, in practice, medieval people across religions in Egypt and other parts of the Near East 
practiced and understood lament in complicated ways that wove together and balanced all of these conceptions and more. In the Islamic context, Peter Webb, in this beautifully titled article, Cry Me a Jahiliya, <laughs> um, argues that images of wild mourning during the age of ignorance that appear in early Islamic sources are really a medieval Islamic construct. So the descriptions and terms for wailing that are used in these accounts don't actually show up in very early sources. They show up later. Um, and he also points out that this account of pre-Islamic wailing elides the very deliberate forms of meditative mourning that we actually find in pre-Islamic poetry. This is just a famous example by a woman. Um, Be generous, my eyes was shedding copious tears. I could not sleep and was awake all night. It was as if my eyes were rubbed with grit. I watched the stars, though it was not my task to watch. A time I wrapped myself in my remaining rag. So this is not a kind of out of control, spontaneous performance. Um, it's a very sort of deliberate poem that would have been memorized and repeated and refined as it was being repeated. And it's worth noting that we only have it in medieval Islamic, man because of medieval Islamic manuscripts. So it's preserved um, throughout the Middle Ages. Conversely, there is abundant evidence that in practice, medieval Muslims practice public lament, hired professional whalers just like Jews. Um, as a standard for this evidence, I will just show a little image. This is from probably the most famous illuminated Arabic manuscript that we have from 13th century Iraq. Most of the books on medieval Islamic history in all libraries are borrowing their book covers from this manuscript. Um, and this is an image of a funeral. And you can't really see from the whole image, so I just made a little close up. Uh, there's a number of women sort of tearing at their cheeks, making that same gesture of the head, and weeping performatively. So this is just like one little bit of visual evidence that this was, in fact, um, quite common um, and standard in many Islamic contexts. This very lovely volume of medieval Arabic tombstone inscriptions includes scores of moving epitaphs expressing sometimes resignation, but also lament. I'll just show you two of them. This is from medieval Yemen. When I called for resignation, for sabr, and for weeping, Weeping obeyed willingly, but resignation didn't. So if hope is cut off from you, grief for you will last as long as time lasts. And um, another uh, epitaph from a place that we don't know. Um, so I think the issue is that this, like an image of this, made its way into a collection, but then the original context was lost. I'm not actually sure. Um, sort of expresses some of what we've seen in Geniza letters about people wanting to be wept for. I wasn't troubled by the fear of death, but I wept for the scant weeping over me. I have to wonder who commissioned that tombstone. In the Jewish context, alongside formal grief and ritual mourning, um, we've already seen hints that Islamically inflected ideas of resignation became a major theme for Arabic-speaking Jews. Um, so there's the reference to the Tzidu Kadin ritual, other hints. Um, Geniza letters are absolutely filled with this theme. And what's really interesting about these letters is that you get alongside these incredibly vivid, detailed accounts of ongoing grief and weeping to the point that people are making themselves blind and ill, um, calls for resignation. And this is a kind of dual script that letter writers seem to adopt without any sense of contradiction. And where I think we have to place the professional mourners in the context of this cultural landscape. So I'm going to close with just two snippets from these really remarkable letters, um, and then I will end. This is an undated letter from a brother to his sister. I'm showing you in part because she's a woman. She's a literate woman. So he tells her, he's like exhorting her to have resignation, have sabr. If you wept for a thousand years, weeping wouldn't help. You'd only become sick, and you'd be the one to perish. This is the same theme of kind of describing the uncontrollable weeping while you're telling the person to stop it. He says, read Ecclesiastes. It will show you how to be strong. But then he says, you should know that you know, I'm crying a lot, too. <laughs> um, and then finally, because I have emphasized gender so much, I want to say that this kind of dual script of extremely performative, almost ritualized mourning by the mourners themselves, not by professionals, alongside calls for resignation, it's not just a gendered thing. We find it with women, but we also find it with men. So I'm going to close with this letter. Um, from a physician, a young physician, to the sultan. So this is a very high-ranking guy to his father in late 12th century Cairo after his brother has died. And he's going on and on about how he behaved like a lunatic in public. Of all the clothing I had on, nothing remained except my loincloth and turban, which was half on my head and half in the mud. 
When I came home, I couldn't pass a fireplace or an oven without putting ashes on my head. My senses were completely lost. Then he says that a whole bunch of Muslim officials from the palace came and told him to knock it off. The Sultan has sent us to console you. This is what he wants to tell you. Accept the loss of your brother as I did when my brother died. The beloved one is a treasure deposited with us by God. The owner takes it back. What can you do? And then he says a few other things, and then he says that he got an eye disease, which is a kind of thing linked to mourning here. So this is not just a random eye disease. This is linked to his mourning. I screamed from the fire in my heart and the pain in my eyes, and he goes on to talk about he went around the town screaming. So these passages are kind of interspersed. So we don't have a lot of really detailed descriptions of professional female mourners, but we have enough to know that they existed, um, that they probably existed at different ranks of society, and that they coexisted in a formal mourning regime that included liturgical poetry, included rabbinic forms of mourning, and also included this very rich, complicated cultural script in which both expressions of mourning and calls for its restraint were sort of meant to be expressed side by side without any apparent need to resolve them. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. I had not thought about that first point in this context at all. Um, it is sort of, there's all this literature which I'm slowly making my way through um, in which I think sort of that point exists, but I had not thought about it in context of the rabbinic sources at all. But that sort of ritualizing mourning obviously is a way of containing it. Um, uh, the rabbinic sources do contain the kind of resignation thing as well, and it's not tied to professional mourners, at least as far as I know, um, although maybe it is. No, no, no. But Right, 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 right. No, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're right. I probably overstated when I said, you know, this Roman distaste is not present because it is as well. It's just not expressed as a kind of, it's more of a theological, it's actually more in line with the later Islamic text than it is with the Roman ones. I think. Maybe. <laughs> It's a great question. Um, no, <laughs> but it's, no, I mean, it's interesting. So this is something puzzling in the Geniza in general, is that a lot of forms of communal sort of um, communal services that we think of as this, you know, confraternities, um, they're, they're not presented that way. Um, it's, there's this single giant communal chest that sometimes gets added, not, not a literal physical chest, but like a, a fund, sometimes gets added to with temporary, um, uh, fundraising initiatives, um, and then it pays out things to people. But it might be a problem with the sources, but we don't have evidence for that. But since I gave you such a disappointing answer, I'll say something interesting about the washing. 
<laughs> which is that um, this washing is not the washing that our Hebra Kadisha does at all. It's the, it's the classical rabbinic just getting the body clean. It has nothing to do with, with purity um, or, or anything like that. That's a later development. And um, another talk I gave out of this project was focused on purity. And I found very interestingly a kind of total lack of concern for corpse purity um, among the Geniza people, which I found really strange. And it's something I'm, I still need to figure out. I know that's not what you asked. That's a really good question. Um, I, I have not at all looked at the Karaite legal texts. It's worth looking at them. Um, in practice, the kind of very short on one foot answer is that a lot of Karaite practices look a lot like Rabbinite ones. Like in theory, Karaites are very different. They have a different theology. If you read their polemical and exegetical literature, it's a whole different world. Uh, but my colleague Marina Resto's first book was kind of showing how on the ground, this is really one integrated community. Um, I don't know if we have evidence for corpse slashing on Karaites altogether, um, like in the Geniza. Um, there are sources that would be worth looking at, though. That's a good point, because there's a lot of stuff about ritual purity in Karaite exegetical and legal sources. Um, I just don't know of any documentary evidence for it. Oh, amazing. I'm going to email you. I don't know how to write that. Um, so no, but yes. So <laughs> um, that's that. That's sort of like I think you're right, but I just there's no like what I just showed you is pretty much the evidence, unfortunately. Um, and I should admit, it all came from Goitain, with the exception of maybe three or four documents. So like he already canvassed this a lot. I just was trying to bring it together and give it context. Um, so there, as far as I know, we don't, at least from the kind of current search methods that are available for searching Geniza documents, have any other references to whalers besides a couple that are just like the ones I already showed you. So there's like not a whole lot of other evidence. On the other hand, like, yes, this was a very, very highly kind of, not stratified, but um, status conscious society in which status was expressed in all kinds of ways. And the closest example to this that you can very clearly see just in the sources I showed you is the shrouds. So um, there is like all kinds, and some of these things Goitain explored, some of them, like I think there's more to be found out, but nobody's really done much work on the material culture embedded in this material, in part because it's just strings of Arabic words that we don't know how to translate, so because uh, like, they don't exist anymore. But um, uh, there's clearly all kinds of gradations. You know, this is a, a very complex kind of visual fashion culture. Um, so just as like things mean things to us that we probably can't even put into words, but you see someone in a kind of outfit and you know exactly where they fit. Like this was happening in this context too, and I'm sure that mourning was part of it. It's just that we don't have like we don't have more granular evidence than what I just showed you. <laughs> I probably don't. <laughs> Right. Oh, that's really nice. Can you say the name? OK, thank you.
formal sort of hiring or is this kind of like getting people there and then, you know, kind yeah. of yeah. some points or how, you know. I mean, I think it is formal, but I don't think it's contracted. Um, the reason I think that is that we have almost no labor contracts in the Geniza altogether, let alone for something so ephemeral. Um, but what was I about to say? Um, we have these inventories of expenses at depth. I think I showed you one, but we have a, 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 a quite a number, like maybe a half a dozen to a dozen of them. Unfortunately, none of them mention whaling, um, and I'm hoping that's just the kind of accident, but like it is weird. There's the one with dancers that I showed you. But there aren't any that mention whaling. They mention the grave diggers and the, the shrouds and the people who build the, the tombstone and, and other things, and the washers. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I have to assume, given that it is a professional moniker, that it was something you got cash for. Um, but just like the question about guilds, like, I just don't know. Like, yeah, we don't have the evidence, unfortunately. I'm just writing down the Yikra Rao. <laughs> One note uh, to Jenny's point in the will of Voksha Aldalala, the uh, very wealthy broker, she does ask also, also for two for cantors. cantors to be paid as part of the burial expenses, like it's like according to his rank and excellence. And I'm not sure whether that's also referring to like how well they recite to be, but there is there is like ranking within that and pay associated with that shit that she's Yeah, thank you very much. I think you have forgotten about that. Um, I was going to call on you. This is Rachel Richmond, who's working on female labor in the Geniza, and she's working on all these other professions that I briefly mentioned. Um, I totally forgotten that her will says that, but um, the cantors we have more evidence for, and we do have, like, um, Sarah, you asked about nuances of rank among the whalers. Like, I don't know, but among the cantors, we do have it. Um, there's this very funny letter sent by a cantor to somebody in his family complaining that, like, he went up to lead the prayers, and they were all yelling at him that he has to do the new kind of chazanas. <laughs> he doesn't know how. Like so, yeah. There, there, there's a lot, and there is evidence for that stuff. I've never worked.